conversation between a psychiatrist in the medical centre of the college and a new student. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. Hello, sit down, please. Thank you. Now you are a new patient, aren't you?、Y、yes, that's right. Okay, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S O N or S E N? H A N S E N. Okay, and you're a first year student. Yes, I am. Study in、uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Two eight o five Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. Two eight o five and Hesperian. Yes, that's H E S P E R I A N, Hayward, H A Y W A R D. And your phone number? Seven three four two four six five five. Seven three four two six four five five. No, you got the six and the four the wrong way round. It's two four six five five. Huh? Sorry. Right. And、um, when were you born? Ah,、uh, the fifteenth of June, nineteen eighty-six. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions five to ten. Good. So, what's your problem? Well, frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to. Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time, and with the support of friends. However. If the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine, it can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy, or? You may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities. Yes, sometimes. At first, I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed. And then... I'm so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I? Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. So, do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last twelve to twenty weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? Well, at first, you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well?、Mm, yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week. 
I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counselling session. Remember, ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counselling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week, I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller generally known as the gravure cylinder. This roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge, called the doctor blade, scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process 
is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced. In other words, with rotogravure, it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One common place where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries. This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will now hear a radio talk on agricultural regulations. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Could there be clearer proof of the arrogance and indifference of those who are supposed to keep our food safe than the muzzling of John Verrill? Agriculture is a business, true, and businesses have to make money. But this shows how ministers and officials put the profits of the agriculture business before the well-being of the British people. Mr Verrill a pharmaceutical chemist, was appointed to represent consumers on one of the many committees that advise the government on food safety. When he tried to do his job, though, and wanted to warn ministers of a danger to children's health, he was refused permission to do so. The danger comes from hormones given to cattle in the USA and some other countries to make them grow faster. They speed up the animal's development to maturity, thus making meat production more profitable. There have, however, long been fears that the hormones have horrendous effects on the people who eat them, causing diseases as serious as cancer. Once these hormones were used on British cattle too, but over 20 years ago they were banned in Europe for being too dangerous. Indeed, so concerned is the European Union that it banned imports of hormone-fed beef years ago, much to the fury of the US government, which wants to sell it all over the world. Several years ago, the USA and Canada asked the World Trade Organization to declare the ban illegal and to punish Europe for failing to lift it. The WTO, with its long record of refusing to let environmental or safety concerns interfere with trade, agreed imposing fines of more than $120 million a year on the EU for its refusal to back down. The British government now backs the Americans, claiming that there is no proof that hormone-fed beef does any harm. This is where Mr Verrill comes in. He is very angry with the government, 
especially as their claim comes out just after a Danish study shows that growth hormones are 200 times more dangerous than was previously thought. Worried by these findings, Mr. Verrill spoke to government representatives, who did nothing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Not only that, but they have not been testing beef which is imported, which, by law, they are required to do. This directly affects the British public, as about 40% of the beef British people eat comes from abroad, supposedly from countries like Brazil, which does not allow the use of growth hormones. Brazilian beef is stocked by some British supermarkets and widely used in catering. Yet, when a Brazilian farm was recently visited by EU inspectors, a large stockpile of this banned substance was found. This is not the first food scandal we have had in our country. Take the present concern over a well-known chocolate company. Several months ago, the company found out that its sweets were contaminated with a rare form of salmonella, but they did nothing about it, leaving their sweets in the shops to be bought by the unsuspecting public. It was not until five months later, when several children had suffered food poisoning, that the chocolate bars were removed from the shelves. It makes you wonder how many other dangerous foods have been allowed onto our plates. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language. Well, the 150th edition has just come out. It sold 32 million copies. Yes, that's right, 32 million. What is it? Roger's Thesaurus. Now, Roger's Thesaurus is a type of dictionary in which words with similar meanings are grouped together. The word Thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's Thesaurus is linguist Dr Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language but what do we know about the man himself? Well, Mr. Roger, or to give him his full name, Peter Mark Roger, was a very interesting man indeed. He grew up in London, he was French, and he spent his early life in a French community there. 
He later travelled all the way from London to Edinburgh to study medicine at the university there, and graduated when he was nineteen years old. And he later went on to become a founder of Manchester Medical School. So his life focused around his career as a doctor. Well, actually, no. Roger had a very wide range of interests, indeed. In fact, he was a writer and wrote about many topics such as bees, the kaleidoscope, and even perception and feeling in animals. And he was an inventor too. In fact, in 1814, he invented an early version of the slide rule. The slide rule? Yes, the device that can calculate numbers. Then, ten years later, he developed a prototype for the cine camera, and he also got involved in a range of different projects. For example, he became head of a commission investigating London's water supply, and he developed a method of water filtration through sand. And he was involved in the area of education. He was one of the founders of London University. And do you play chess by any chance, Mark? Yes, I do. Well, Roger invented the travelling chess set. So next time you're playing a game of chess on a train, you have Mr. Roger to thank. So, how did he actually find the time to classify the English language? Well, he only turned his full attention to the thesaurus when he retired, and that was when he was in his seventies. So, what inspired him to write the thesaurus? Well, Roger believed that he should bring as much happiness and knowledge to the greatest number of people. So, during his career as a doctor, he gave free treatment to patients who couldn't afford to pay. We also know that he set up a clinic to help poor people to recover from operations and serious illnesses. Basically, he wrote the thesaurus to help people learn. He aimed to help those who needed practice in writing. He believed that writing skills would help people become more independent and lead happier lives. How popular is the thesaurus today? Well, it was first published in 1852, and it has never been out of print since. In fact, the book has become more popular with each edition that comes out. The invention of the crossword puzzle in 1913 certainly helped to increase the sales figures, though. I think the main reason why it is so popular is that it's thematic, so you can come across words that you've never even thought of when you began looking for the word in the first place. Thanks, Cindy. Now join us again after this short break. When I'll be talking to Derek Spode, chairperson of East Anglia New. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.